Welcome to Shoreline Conversations. My name is Thomas, and this is the second episode in our new Pillar series, where we're talking about the pillars of Christian faith, the the big things that Christians believe. You know, there's a lot of disagreements in the Christian family about certain things, but there are some things that Christians all agree on, the foundational things that make us Christians. And that's what we're talking about. That's what this series is last week. We talked about God. Uh, Christians believe in God, obviously, uh, but we talked about, you know, what we believe about God. Exactly what's the theology behind Christians' belief in God. And this week, we get to talk about the Incarnation. And uh, that's referring to Jesus coming to earth as a human. And we'll get into it. And Kevin is back with me as I host and ask some questions. Unfortunately, though, this week uh, there was a problem with the main audio track. Uh, the, uh, the crisp podcast audio uh, this week is not present. We had to use the backup audio from the camera uh, hopefully I, we figured out what was wrong with it. And so it shouldn't happen again, but, uh, it was bound to happen eventually. And, uh, we hope that you enjoyed the episode despite the echoey sounding room. It should still be all pretty clear, but, uh, forgive us this grievance. And next week we'll be back to that crisp podcast audio that, uh, hopefully, you love and uh yeah anyway we're gonna get into it just needed to give you a heads up there in case you're wondering why it sounds like we're doing this podcast in a kitchen <laughs> it's just straight from one of the cameras so we'll just get into it this week talking about the incarnation well kevin thank you uh for being back with us here at our second episode of the uh we're calling it the pillars series just talking about the pillars of christian faith Last time we talked about God, uh, there was so much more we could have talked about, but we covered the basis, the theology behind God, or, or as you said, the theology behind theology. Yep. And uh, today we're transitioning, still technically on the God topic, but we're talking specifically about Jesus. Yep. And, uh, and we're talking about the incarnation. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, could you define that word for us? What is the incarnation? Yeah, and when you say that, we could have talked more. The topic of God is a big one, so we can we can go on and on and on um, with an infinite being. I suppose conversation could be infinite. It's true. But um, incarnation, from from a from a theological standpoint, it's the, it's that uh, spiritual reality that the God who is spirit, the God who is eternal, the God who is, as we talked about in the first podcast, you know, omnipotent, all you know, which all powerful, omniscient, knows everything, omnipresent, is everywhere, is immutable, unchangeable. And yet that God chose to incarnate, to indwell, to come within time. Mm -hmm. So incarnation, most people think about it was the enfleshment that Jesus took on a human body. Right. But for God to enter into time, mm -hmm. to enter into space, to enter into human history, not just to superintend overall history, uh, but to enter into human history and then to enter into a physical uh, being, to be, to be conceived by the Spirit in the womb of a virgin... Uh, very physical, very tangible, physical, physically present, uh, and then to be born uh, and to dwell on this earth for 32 to 33 years among us. The incarnation is sort of all of that. God, uh, Emmanuel, God with us. It's that process of God becoming uh, one of us, among us, with us, and yet still somehow maintaining his divinity while taking on humanity. Right. So once you got that, the rest of it's pretty much downhill from there. It's <laughs> yeah, easy. easy. All right. Well, we could just wrap up the episode. No, okay, so we're talking about uh, a God becoming not only flesh, but but like you said, entering into space and time. Um, but let's let's now that we've kind of got a broad definition of that, let's kind of focus in on on Jesus, the yeah. the human body of Jesus. Um, historically speaking, who was Jesus during his time on Earth? Well, he, when you frame it historically speaking, that would I, that would my answer would be it depends on who you're asking. True. Um, so if you ask, there, there was a whole group called the Jesus Seminar, a group of, a group of scholars, uh, some who would claim to be Christians, some, some who would claim not to be Christians, who got together and they kind of voted, they actually voted by putting different colored beads in jars, and they voted on who Jesus was. Uh -huh. uh, I, I'm not so much a beads in the jars uh, discerns who Jesus was kind of guy. Uh, I'm more, uh, this this book discerns uh, and describes who, who he was. And so uh, I would say... Um, 
though all through history people have defined Jesus differently. Even in his own day, people have different right. perspectives on who Jesus was. At one point, Jesus says to his disciples, you know, who do people say that I am? So now we're going into the during the life of Jesus, no time has passed, no history's passed. Mm -hmm. And while he walked on this earth, he says to his followers, Who do what's the word on the street? Who do people say that I am? Right. And the answers were fascinating. Well, some say you are John the Baptist who had died, so it would mean he would have had to raise again. But some say you're one of the prophets. Some say you're a specific prophet, just one of the prophets. And all these theories, all of them were, all of them were very powerful people, influential people. There, maybe, maybe he's this person, this person, come back to life again. Right. And then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And that's really the question, that's the question that defines Christianity. When you go beyond the theology to the practical, you know, spiritual journey of a person, it's who do you say Jesus is? Right. And uh, and Peter and, and later on Jesus says Peter you didn't come up with that on your own you know that wasn't that wasn't you're not that smart uh, but he says he says you're the Christ you're the Son of the Living God you are the Christ the Messiah the Anointed One the Son of the Living God and 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 technically Jesus Jesus didn't say bingo but basically what he said was the uh, Aramaic version of bingo and the, yeah, in the Aramaic it would be bingo give them a cupid doll yeah. so it's like you win you got it you got it right but but Jesus said. That wasn't that wasn't from you. That was from above, mm -hmm. and so so Jesus would have said, uh, you know, you know, I'm the Messiah. I'm the Savior. Now he he guarded that reality when he walked on this earth because he knew he didn't want to become a political figure. And some people thought that the Messiah was a political savior. He didn't. There were times where he would actually reveal who he was, and he'd say, "But don't talk about it right now." He right. say, and then. Almost invariably, the person would go out and blab about it. Next, the next kind of scene in the Bible is, and then the person went out and started saying, "Hey, guess what?" Yeah. But um, I guess that that's that's people. But as for <laughs> as for Jesus, um, the incarnate presence of God among us, Jesus Christ, uh, the Messiah, the Savior, and the Son of God. Beautiful man. There's so much. There's so many different places I want to go with that. Just, just yeah. I, I mean, it's a whole topic in and of itself. His time on Earth. The way he acted, even his parables, he said, you know, you know, these are meant to be confusing. Yeah, yeah, I'm just, yeah. You're supposed to be confused. It's like, wait, yeah. what? Like, I thought you were just that reality of the depth of who he was. And the, and now we get the, the privilege of looking retrospectively. Right. We get to look at the bird's eye view. Yeah. But but uh, as it happened, um, man, there's so many different so many different places we can yeah. focus on and his own disciples who walked with him were still understanding who right. he was and didn't totally get it. Mm -hmm. And some didn't get it at all, like Judas, where he was kind of like, well, okay, I thought he was a political guy who was going to take over and overcome the Roman government. He didn't fulfill what I wanted, so he would, I think he felt comfortable turning his back on him. Mm -hmm. So even one of his closest followers, you know, when we look and say, well, if I, if I had been there with Jesus, yeah. <laughs> I would have got it, I would have understood. It's the, it's the same kind of hubris and arrogance that says, if I had been in Nazi Germany, I would have been Schindler. Uh, I'd been the one protecting and saving yeah. the Jews. I, I would, you know, we imagine ourselves, uh, yeah. unfortunately, sometimes in the most perfect of lights. And even, you know, but if you look at the raw numbers of the, the, the Holocaust and what happened in Germany, the, there were very few Schindlers and there were tens of thousands of people who looked the other way. Right. And so when we say, well, if I, if I had walked with Jesus, then I would have... I, I would have never turned my back like Peter did. I would never doubt like Thomas did. I would. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, let's not give ourselves too much credit, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's a complex topic. And even those listening right now, I, I hope would say, I want to be on this journey of understanding, of learning more and more and more, and asking the hard questions mm -hmm. and grappling with those things. And I think that Christians, once even once you're a follower of Jesus, one of the greatest postures is to be that be that of a student. I mean, he, Jesus was the rabbi. And they, his disciples were learners from him. Yeah. And to not say, okay, I, I got it all figured out. I got it all nailed down. I can give you all my little button-down simple answers. But say, let's talk, let's think, let's grapple with this. Because the vastness of who God is and the vastness of who Jesus, God in human flesh was, is, is absolutely beyond our comprehension. Any thought that we've got it figured out is, is yeah. crazy. It's not to say I'm, I'm getting deeper glimpses, understanding more. I think we can know enough to be deeply confident and hold to our faith. But we also have to have the humility to say, but there's a whole lot I don't know. Yeah. So it's 
it seems to be not only humbling, mm-hmm. but encouraging to somebody who might be on this road and being yeah. like, man, I don't really get it quite mm-hmm. yet. I know there's something here, yeah. Yeah. but like, oh, well, the, the disciples, the guys who yeah. met him in person yeah. had that same journey, yeah. Yeah. you know, the, the, and, and also humbling in, yeah. in the sense that I think a lot of us think that we've got it all figured out and it's, it's nice and buttoned up, but there's a, yeah. there's a depth. And especially when you, when you read and reread and reread and reread the gospels yeah. and you find these things like, how did I not see that before? How did I not just yeah. like these little nuggets? But, um, okay. So you, you actually mentioned when, when Jesus asked Peter who he said he was and Peter's response. Um, let's go into that a little bit. Yeah. Who, so we asked who was Jesus historically? And obviously yeah. there's, as with all these topics, we could spend uh, uh, so much more time on that. And we encourage people to really dig deeper. There's so many great resources out there. But let's transition to who is Jesus yeah. theologically. Yeah. So we believe Jesus is still alive and, yeah. and has eternally been alive. So who is Jesus? That that response that Peter gave, what's that mean? Yeah, not only does Peter give that response, but as you walk through the Gospels, and then you go to the uh, the teachings of the early church, um, the uh, creeds and even songs of the early church as they were as they were understanding this and growing their understanding of Jesus, you know, the Apostle Paul's writing um, and the, the letters to the early churches have a lot of, uh, and, and you were talking about this, you know, we're looking at theology, but this, this aspect of theology would be, the incarnation would be part of a subset of, the, of Christology, the doctrine of Jesus and who Jesus right. is. Um, there's a number of, you know, like deeply Christological passages uh, in the New Testament once you get out of the Gospels where they're, they're grappling with, okay, who is this Jesus? They're trying to I believe inspired by the Holy Spirit, but trying to clarify that for the church now. You know, so the book of Philippians, the book of Colossians, were the letters to the churches in the city of Philippi, the city of Colossae. And the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is saying, they have to clarify exactly the question you asked. Who is this Jesus, this mm-hmm. incarnate one who came? And so I just, um, I want, I'll share a couple of quick passages that are, the, the first one, Philippians chapter 2, uh, most scholars would say this is actually was a, Part of a hymn that was being that you know that it was um, the, the the early believers were writing songs of worship and praise, which the Bible encourages us to do. Right. But they were trying to contain their theology within it. And so in Philippians chapter two, we read, in speaking of Jesus, we're told to have the, the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And then it says, well, who is this Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be. And there's so many different translations here. And the, the, the NIV says, used to his own advantage. Mm-hmm. The concept is held to for his own good, but clung to or held to. He didn't hold to that position. It says, rather, he made himself as nothing. And that's the, word, the, the, the Greek word there, kenosis, is he poured himself out. Made himself as nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. There's the incarnation, the, yep. the enfleshing of Jesus, right? Uh, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Not only did he incarnate, but he incarnated and came for a reason, and that was then to lay his life down. Right. And then it goes to the exaltation, and it says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge or confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what you have in Philippians 2 is this sense of, the exalted nature of Christ, right. the, the, the the humbling and willing pouring out of, of, and this is the tricky part, pouring out what exactly so that he could come to be among us. Mm-hmm. And that's that has uh, led to thousands and tens of thousands of pages of theology and debate and argument, but mm-hmm. but that, that he emptied himself of something. I, I lean towards thinking more the classical philosophical attributes of God. I believe that when Jesus walked on this earth, he was not omnipresent because he was in flesh. Right. Um, I believe that he was uh, was he omnipotent. Well, he he felt pain mm-hmm. um, when the nails went through his wrists, and when they scourged him, he felt. He said, "I'm thirsty," hanging on the cross, and so there's an omnipotent being say, "I'm thirsty." You know, so right. so I don't believe that the moral attributes of of divinity were compromised, but there was some kind of something that was emptied out, and I'm not even saying that's exactly what it was because I'm not going to dare to say yeah. I know exactly what it was. Yeah. But in, in the in the great Christ hymn of Philippians 2, we see him exalted, we see him pour himself out, willingly choose, come as one of us, and then to die the bitter, shameful death of the cross, and then the exaltation, and yet every tongue shall declare, every knee will bow, 
Mm -hmm. And so there's sort of this, he's here, he comes down, he's incarnated, he's one of us, and then he dies on the cross. After three days, he rises again. After a time hanging out on around uh, that, that, the region, that region, preaching, teaching, walking through walls, serving meals, yeah. preparing meals, and you know, all these everything, then he ascends back to the Father. So, you know, that, so all that's contained in this one passage. Yeah. And so that, that could be... Something easy to memorize back yeah, in the day. Exactly. And then, and then in Colossians, in Colossians chapter 1, again, Paul is writing to the church and he says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Not as he create everything, he sustains everything. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So it's ultimate ruling over all things. Mm -hmm. For God was pleased, now this is key, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, in Jesus. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. A lot of theology there. Right. But wait, that's not all. <laughs> Last There's one. more. <laughs> There's more. Don't order yet. Um, and so uh, in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, we read, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Those three passages, Philippians 2, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, um, are probably three. And Hebrews is not, we don't know who Hebrews is written by. It's not. Mm -hmm. a, some people think it was the Apostle Paul. Other people, it, it, doesn't really, it was inspired by God, written by somebody, but it doesn't have a name on it. Right. But, but those three uh, pieces right there are probably three of the most um, kind of brief and yet powerfully clear declarations of this incarnated right. Jesus who came among us and the connection to, to his death, to his resurrection. And so those would be, if somebody who wants to dig into this topic, those would be great passages to kind of, a great starting point, a great primer. Yeah, yeah a primer because, yeah, <clears throat> as with many things in this conversation, it's like you can take one line and go on a whole journey yeah. and then yeah. come back later and go. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of a lot of times I feel like when we say Jesus, the mental image is Jesus, the fully man mm -hmm. uh, on earth. But man, you read those and you really get this bigger picture of Jesus, this yeah. this huge and, and maybe something that I think maybe a lot of non-believers don't actually uh, realize is something that Christians believe is that Jesus isn't just. God became man, came to earth to die for our sins, and he rose, and that was done, and Jesus' role fulfilled, and yeah. and let's now move on, right? Yeah. You know, maybe the now next chapter, Holy Spirit, or, or whatever. Yeah. But Jesus is Jesus is part of the story far before that, and he's part of the story far after that. And he's not, he doesn't remain this limited being. Go into a little bit about maybe Jesus today, like, where is Jesus right now? Maybe that's a great way to put it for somebody who maybe um, is is kind of just realizing that Jesus might be a little bit more than than the person that we read about in the Bible. Yeah. You know, the, the actual events. Where is Jesus right now? Yeah. So where that takes me first, and before we get before I get real serious, yeah. Um, there's a character, Father Guido Sarducci. I don't know if you've heard him. Catholic priest. Uh, he's a caricature. Okay. And there's there's a, a bit where he says. Uh, he says uh, the Vatican has uh, put together a school. Mm -hmm. He called it the Five Minute University, and he says that the, the, the Five Minute University says that because what we teach it, we teach in five minutes what you remember from university ten years after you graduate. Yeah. It's only about five minutes of stuff. And he said, of course, because it's, it's run by the Vatican. This is obviously a joke. The Vatican yeah. doesn't have a school. <laughs> he says because it's run by the Vatican, we have a theology course. And he says and this is the theology course. The professor says, "Where is God?" And then the class is back to him. God is everywhere. And the professor says, why? And the class says, because he likes you. <laughs> so so uh, you can say, well, where is Jesus? Well, he's everywhere. Well, he's in my heart. You know, there's, there's, yeah. there's, there's simple answers that are, you know, because Jesus is divine, uh, fully divine, he is omnipresent, so he's everywhere. Uh, because Jesus is imminent, intimate, and loving, by his spirit, he dwells in our hearts. That's all true. Yeah. But the Bible also says that he, uh, and this is, this is uh, 
this is language used to uh, to so that we can understand. Right. But you know that he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Mm-hmm. So the sense of which which there is the idea of the final authority, and so. Uh, Jesus rules and reigns, and if we, some people will almost think, well, Jesus was divine when he was in heaven, then he was human when he came as a person, and then after he died and rose again, then he went back to heaven and he was divine again. Yeah. But, but because of the nature of who God is, Jesus was divine through all of that. Right. Fully divine, and this is the part that stretches beyond our comprehension, not, uh, maybe not omnipresent at that point because he chose to take, take on flesh, mm-hmm. But still perfectly holy, perfectly loving, and so, uh, so, so Jesus was, you know, divine before he walked on this earth, divine while he walked on this earth, divine while he was on the cross, paying the price for our sins, uh, divine, uh, the divine uh, Son of God when he was buried in the tomb. How does that work? There's parts beyond, like you know, and then as he rose again, and as he ascended to heaven, and as he is eternally with the Father before and after he walked on this earth, divine through all of that. Right. And so if you say, you know, you can say, where is Jesus now? I think that's one question. What is Jesus doing now is another question. Yeah. The where is, I, I don't think of, of God in terms of locality. There's people that will say, well, heaven's up there in this space and God's hanging out there. Right. That's more, that would be more Norse, uh, Greek, Roman mythology that there's a Mount Olympus or yeah. there's, uh, uh, you know, there's this place where the gods or God hang out and it's a, a bounded set location here mm-hmm. um i don't think that god god functions in that way and even when, even when we think about heaven um the bible talks about a new heaven and a new earth don't know exactly how all that works i believe that there's there is a a uh, that we will be in fleshed beings we won't be wandering spirits everything the bible doesn't teach that we become disembodied spirits it, it's that we become more real and so if you're if there are real eternal beings they, there is a space but for right now at least I think of God not so much in Jesus, not as a residing in a location, right. but in a state of being where he is ruling, reigning. One of the things the Bible says is that he's actually interceding for us, mm-hmm. which I, I, I thought about this recently I was, in a way it hadn't hit me before, that Jesus came to serve. He washed feet. He was a humble servant, which is staggering. God in human flesh serving people. But then when he died on the cross, when he rose again, when he ascended to heaven, you think, well, now he rules and reigns. Yes, but he's also still serving. Right. Because the Bible says that it, as we're walking through our lives, he's interceding for us. That, that Jesus Christ, the risen Messiah and Lord of all, God Almighty, is that when you, Thomas, are going through your life, he's interceding on your behalf. Right. You know, that's just mind-boggling. Yeah. That, that this glorious God would be that interested in you or me or any one person but what the Bible teaches is that he's actually actively interceding on our behalf out of love for us. So, so to me, what's really interesting is what is he doing right now? Yeah. That's one of the things that Jesus is doing right now. Yeah. Is interceding for the people he loves. And you go, that's pretty, that's, that's fascinating. You know, it's, 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 um, and it hit me as I was working on it, I was doing some writing on that topic and it just hit me in a fresh new way. It's like the Jesus, you know, the, the flesh Jesus, the incarnate Jesus who washed the disciples' feet at the Last Supper. It's recorded in John chapter 13. Um, okay, when he walked in flesh on this planet, he was a servant. But once he's ascended to heaven, then he's back to the Lord of glory. Well, yes, he is, yeah. but he's also still like helping us out. He's yep. interceding for us. And you go, that that's, um, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing and powerful to say. It, it, it says a lot about the character of God, yeah. but also the power of God. You know, right. uh, you mentioned... Um, a lot of times, yeah, we do like to think of, of heaven as this place, and we have these old ideas that kind of sneak into Christianity. But just, you know, I, I feel for some people, they might be like, oh, I don't even want to go there. You know, yeah. it's too mind-bending. But the idea that there's, you know, maybe different layers to reality that we just can't comprehend. Yeah. And that God is, God is, you know, really functions uh, in those places, and it's not a place where you can. Well, let me let me research that layer of reality. It's just something we have to yeah. to wait for, and and that's not something unique to Christianity. And you know, sometimes people, oh, well, that's getting too mystical. I mean, purely secularly, I mean, it's pretty clear that there's a lot we don't understand, right? There's there's layers out <clears> here <throat> that um, are just beyond our comprehension in any walk of life, and so just to think about God functioning at that level and also 
at the point where he's interceding for us yeah. is uh, it's a really perfect kind of uh, representation of, of yeah. just the kind of the two not two natures because he has he's so much bigger than that but but the the intimate side of God yeah. and the powerful yeah. side of God. Well, and as 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 you think about that and you think about um, you know the, the nature of God and there's people who will say. Well, you know, Christianity, there's, there, there's skeptics. who well, Christianity is just borrowed from other ancient worldviews and religions. Mm -hmm. But if you look, if, if you study, which I, ha if you, I have, <clears throat> at one point I knew all of the, uh, the names for all of the, the, the Greek pantheon of gods, the Roman pantheon of gods. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've got uh, Zeus and Jupiter. You've got, you know, you go back and forth between, you know, they the same role, but different characters. Right. And if you look at Norse uh, mythology, which I've also studied, you look at, if you look at these different ancient, uh, belief systems, uh, the idea of of a God who would come among us humbly to serve. Um, you, you, the mythology of Roman and and Greek mythology had had the gods coming among people to to do really kind of weird, creepy, controlling <laughs> things and to get kind of in, in Lots of mess creepy. with their lives. But but the idea of coming to humbly serve, to die for people, and then once exalted to continue with that that heart of service mm -hmm. that's that's not borrowed from that, that there's there's i i know of no i know of no uh world religion right. that uh that that's 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 unique and i think it's unique because it's true it's, it's mm -hmm. it didn't come out of other things it came out of the reality of god coming among us and doing what he did and continuing in this time to be involved in our lives yeah. So, yeah yeah even in historical writings i think when pre kind of the rise of christianity and post you see a, a dramatic uh, a shift in the way stuff is written and the way people write kings write about this they're they're after like the way the effect that jesus had yeah. the effect that that theology had in like it, it really shifted the i mean you, you know the, the the stereotypical roman bravado in the in the gladiator like look at me you know yeah. that, that that kind of uh it's kind of distasteful yeah. these days yeah. it's just yeah. like ooh, that's that's yeah. too much yeah but um anyway moving on we can get we can get stuck in so many places here because there's so much to say but um one of the things i wanted to talk about is that we hear a lot that uh, god sent his only son mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um and there's two there's kind of two parts to this what does it mean that god sent jesus mm -hmm. and then why is jesus called the son uh, and so we can start out, what, what, what's it mean when God sent? Yeah. Seeing as, you know, obviously we've kind of established that there's some things that are a little bit out of our ability mm -hmm. to perceive, mm -hmm. but how can we as Christians understand that kind yeah. of language? Yeah, I think there's times where God uses language that we can understand mm -hmm. because um, he is so beyond our comprehension. And so sometimes there's language that will be um, adopted, I think, or used I think of like when Moses says, uh, uh, "God, if I, you know, God, if I could just see your face, let me, see, let me see your glory." Mm -hmm. And God says to Moses, "Well, here's what I'll do. I'll put you in the cleft of these rocks. I'll come by, and I'll cover you with my hand, which is a, which was anthropomorphism, which is a, yeah. giving a human attribute to a divine being. But God says, for your sake, you know, I'll cover you with my hand, so you understand yeah. what I'm talking about." I'll pass by, and when I've passed by, I'll remove my hand, and you'll see my fleeting glory. The point is, my glory is so great that once I'm past, like I'm past, I'm down the road, and you get, I'll give you like a little fleeting glimpse. Yeah. And and then so God says that's what we do. So God does this, and then Moses glows mm -hmm. for and has a veil over his face because people are freaked out because he's glowing. He's like spiritually radioactive, you yeah. know, for an extended period of time till the glow kind of wears off. And the people have done lots of, you know. You know, the Shekinah glory, they've done lots of yeah. wacky things with that, but 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 to understand that God in that moment is saying to Moses, let me do this, do something in a way that you can understand and give you a glimpse of my glory. But he says, But if you were to see me in the fullness, fullness of my glory, you just would just drop over. Right. It'd be over for you because my yeah. glory, it's it's and it would be like saying if you drop somebody into a, a completely radioactive environment, yeah, it would kill them, not because radio radiation is, is evil but because it has because it breaks down the, the cells of the body right? right and god's saying because of my glory is so intense you can't experience it so so i think when we say okay god sent his son and it's good for songs god sent his son they yeah. called him Jesus. You know, yeah it's great for songs and it's and it's true yeah but we but we have to understand that for our minds to comprehend it we've got to kind of dig in all this so i have a couple things that go through my mind and i guess it's a fascinating question one is that 
you get the sense that God in his in his divine triune nature, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, yeah. um, sort of counsels within his own one one in being, three in persons. But the, you know, so so you have like at the beginning, God said, "Let us make man in our image, and let us you know make him in our likeness." Yeah. Well, why is God talking in Middle English? Is God is it like the Queen of England? Yeah. We we are not we are not pleased. You know, is that what's going on? No, it's it's <laughs> actually it's actually God saying. Uh, I may be one. I may be one in being, but I'm three in persons, and so there's this, almost this divine counsel of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think biblically we look and say Jesus was not. Um, you know, some people say, you know, who put Jesus on the cross? Was it the Jews? Was it the Romans? And ultimately, I think theologically, we have to say, well, Jesus allowed himself to be put on the cross. Right. As a matter of fact, Jesus says, "No one takes my life; I lay it down; I take it up again." Jesus was clear. You, you only think you have power over me, but I ultimately have chosen to lay my life down. Yep. Uh, and so who sent Jesus? Well, I believe God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit knew our need as human beings, understood our sin, understood the way to redemption. And I don't know if there's another podcast on this or not, but the, you know, the way to redemption and salvation came through the sacrifice of Jesus. And so I believe that Jesus was willing in heart. I believe that the triune God Within his, within his divine community, mm -hmm. um, made that choice, and yet the the father had a certain role of of authority. Jesus said, "I only do what the father calls me to do. Mm -hmm. I only say what the father calls me to say." He said, "Okay, well now you're saying that Jesus is under the father, and now you have a subservient being. So how's that a trinitarian unity?" Right. Well, I, I look at that no different than saying, um, "I pastor Shoreline Church, mm -hmm. and I'm the lead pastor." Yep. There are certain times where. I have a role. I have a role and responsibility that I make decisions. And Thomas, you work at the church, and so I, do. Um, I, I try to never wield that in a capricious way. I don't try to go around bossing people around. Uh, we're online here. I don't know what your you know what your feelings are on this topic, but, but <laughs> let me get some things off <laughs> my chest. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, I, I look at I look at it, and I and I I say, but I have I am not more valuable than you. I am not better than you. Uh, I, have, I, have, I may have a different educational pathway. I may have different spiritual giftings. Standing before God, we are absolutely equal. Right. At Shoreline Church and the daily functioning of the church, I have a role of responsibility where I make certain decisions and I lead a certain way because I'm in that role. Yeah. Somehow in the in the divine uh, Trinitarian Godhead, one being absolutely equal, read the Athanasius Creed in every area, as the Father is, so the Son is, so the Holy Spirit is, equal in every way, and yet Jesus said, I do what the Father calls me to do. I say what the Father calls me to say. There's a yielding to a role of authority. Does that make, mean that God the Father is more powerful than God the Son, or does it mean that there's a different role? Right. And, and, I'm, and I'm very careful talking about these things because all through the history of the church, almost any step left or right out of the straight, narrow line has been declared heresy yeah. at some point along the way by somebody. <laughs> and so, and so I, I am an Orthodox, Bible-believing uh, Christian yeah. uh, pastor. And when I say Orthodox, I don't mean the Orth the Eastern Orthodox Church. Right, I right. mean Christian Orthodoxy, biblical, historical Historical, Orthodoxy. Yeah. Uh, And so, I think that um, that you know that to me is there's different places in in life where God gives people unique roles, mm -hmm. but that doesn't make them role a role in a a role in a family, a role in a church. Yeah. Um, and those aren't a matter of better or worse more important or less important, more valuable or less valuable, yeah. it's equal with different roles. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean you, we can get into essence and persons and the philosophical meanings behind those words. Yeah. Uh, I, I think maybe for listeners struggling to comprehend this kind of thing, um, you, you know, you mentioned it, um, even you as a pastor being nervous, got to make sure I'm saying it. You know, there's there's a certain amount of, of this is going to be confusing. I mean, yeah. by nature, at this point, we're getting into things about God that, you know, if God wanted to just lay it out for us, he would, he would do that. He would have done that. Uh, he didn't deem it important, or maybe the pursuit itself yeah. is what he deemed important. Yeah. So at this point, you know, we're, this is really philosophy at this yeah. point, you know, yeah. theology and philosophy historically are very much tied yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but it's, it's still fascinating, but it, but it's also kind of, it's worth saying, like, if this is, you know, busting your brain, that that's okay. Yeah, you know, yeah. don't be afraid that people are going to yell heretic at you well, while you're trying to figure this out. And if you ha if you think you have everything figured out and pinned down, 
then you 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 right. probably don't. Yeah, yeah, that's a problem in its own right. Yeah. Yeah. We can yell heretic right back, and we can exactly. start yelling at each other. That's oh, and that, that, that has been done for the history of the church. <laughs> I'm sure it has. So that being said, um, we are you're being really careful to make sure as we talk about Jesus being fully man that we're not taking his uh, divinity away. Why is it so important? That we established that that Jesus was fully God. That we don't like. Oh well, maybe maybe they're not, and that's okay. Maybe we're, um, you know, maybe we believe in two gods. Maybe we're duotheists. Uh, yeah. uh, why is it really important that we don't slip down that path? Yeah, and and that's and, you know, and that's one of the and and heresy does to most heresy through the history of the church is not absolute untruth. Mm-hmm. It's taking something that's true. And pushing it so hard that you exclude other things that are true. Right. So, so in in this in this discussion of the incarnation of Jesus and the, in the discussion of the divine and human nature of Jesus, you can end up in heresy if you push the divinity of Jesus so far that you rip away the humanity and say he was never really truly in flesh in a human being. Right. And we can talk about why it's important that we hold to the, to the full uh, humanity of Jesus and the full divinity. You're asking right now about the divinity, but and, and then you can err to the side of saying. I'm so emphasizing the human nature of Jesus that I really do away with his divine nature. Right. And we can talk about both. Yeah. Yeah. Either, yeah. Either and, one's equal. And so, and so both, I mean, and both are critical. So let's start with the, the divine nature of Jesus. Um, why is it essential that we hold to that? I'd say number one, and primarily because it's true. <laughs> and, and Jesus was divine. He was, he was God among us. He was Emmanuel, God with us. And mm-hmm. all through the prophets, all through the Old Testament, all through the New Testament, if you want to, you know, if you look at like epic themes, mega themes that run through the scriptures, um, the, 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 the coming Messiah, the Messiah who came, uh, the Messiah who now leads the church after Jesus, you know, before Jesus walked on this earth, while he did the Gospels, and then the epistles, and beyond that, and the general epistles, and the Revelation, Hebrews, all that. Um, that theme runs all the way through, pointing to the Messiah while he walked on this earth, and afterward, that he, that it was, that he was God with us. And right. so, but also, on a, on a theological level, if we... If we let go of that, I would say you need, you need to hold to both aspects of the divine nature and the human nature of Jesus. Um, if you let go of the divine nature, all kinds of things go wrong. But theologically, um, for Jesus to die in our place for our sins, he couldn't just be a man. Right. Because if, if a man could have done it, then we could have done it for ourselves. Yep. Uh, the, reason, the reason that God chose to... Um, have the second person of the trade that God chose himself to come among us was that our sin and our offense was against the infinite perfect God of heaven well who can pay the price for an offense against infinite God we're finite we can we can never pay and and, and we often look at you know our, our view of sin uh, which the, is the word the Bible uses just for falling short of God's standards what he wants right. what he has planned for us um, you know, our view is often like the the, the the scales in in the sky kind of philosophy that says, well, I do some good things, I do some bad things, but you know, it's pretty. The junior high years were pretty rough. Senior high, college, I don't even want to talk about. You know, and so all these things. But then I, I kind of grew up and I got married and had a kid and I tried to love my kids and I, mm-hmm. I you know, I, 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 every time I go by one of those um, Salvation Army things at Christmas time, I put in a buck or two or something mm-hmm. at least in my pocket. You know, and I, I do enough things and then ah, boom, boom, and the doors of heaven open. Yeah. Right. Um, from a from a heavenly viewpoint from a biblical viewpoint one sin and one offense against the infinite perfect holy god so weights the scales that there's nothing we can do to overcome that Mm -hmm. the but because we're finite but the the weight of the price paid by god himself an infinite price boom tips the scales yeah and and again it's not scales ultimately it's it's the work of jesus and when a person that receives that for themselves um that can wash away our sins and so uh, so for me, if, theologically, if you let go of the divinity of Jesus, then you really have a person who's, and, and many people say, well, he was a great moral teacher, he was a wonderful person, he was a great example. Mm-hmm. Although if you, if you, the, the primary source we have for who Jesus is, is the Bible. If you read the Bible, he never just claimed to be a great moral person. Right. And a great moral person doesn't live in such a way that his followers, many of them end up, end up being martyred and losing their lives for following his teaching. Mm-hmm. A great, a great um, a great teacher and a wonderful rabbi doesn't say I'm God. Yeah. And so Jesus was if, if Jesus wasn't divine, then then the option is and C.S. Lewis breaks this down. I won't get into right. his whole liar, Lord, lunatic um, discussion. But if, if Jesus wasn't who he said he was, which was divine, 
then he was a really mixed up and troubled or very devious person. Right. And let's not call him a wonderful teacher and a good moral example. Yep. And so, so, so in his divinity, he could pay the price for it. So I would say that that's a, a primary thing. In terms of his humanity, um, Jesus died in our place for our sins. Now we're, in, we're, we're in the, the, under the umbrella of theology. Uh, one of the areas is soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation. And so now we're kind of wondering, but under Jesus' incarnation, his life, death, resurrection, that's part of the conversation. I don't know if you can do another podcast on that, but this, just to, to dip our toe into that for a minute here. Um, because um, he was fully human, he could actually die in our place for our sins and take our shame upon himself. And so if we don't believe he was fully human, he couldn't really die in our place. Right. So fully divine, so he could have he, he could pay the price, an infinite price of an offense against uh, you know, an, an, an infinite holy God. And because he's human, he could actually take our shame, take our pain, and bear it on himself. And uh, it's a story I've told many times, but it was a profound one for me. Uh, when I was a youth group leader, a little junior high girl um, came to me one time. She was a new believer, had grown up in a non-Christian home, and she was so troubled about the idea of Jesus dying on the cross for her sins. Mm -hmm. It just was hard for her to think about because she had fallen in love with Jesus and she didn't want to think of him suffering. So right. she came to me and she actually said, uh, I figured out, I think I figured out what Jesus did when he was on the cross. And I thought, well, that's an interesting topic for a junior high girl. And I said, well, I said Tricia, what, what do you think? And she said, well, I think that Jesus, she said he was all powerful, right? And I said, well, you know, that's a philosophical question. He was in the flesh, yeah. but I just, I said, yes, you know, he was all powerful. And I said, well, she said, well, I, I think he made it so he wouldn't feel any pain. And that made her little junior high heart feel better. Right. Like her, her Jesus didn't feel any pain. And, I, and so I had to kind of like swallow and go, oh boy, I got to tell this girl the theological <laughs> truth. And so now we're doing theology with junior high kids, right? But I said to her, I said to her, Trisha, I said, actually, I say, I, I get your heart. And I, I kind of tried to say, mm -hmm. I know what you're trying to do here. But I said, he felt everything you would have felt. And he felt all the pain you would have felt. And on top of that, he felt all the shame for all the wrongs you've done. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, you're a mean pastor telling your little kid that. No, um, if Jesus truly died in her place, and he was in flesh. He felt the pain of the nails. He felt the he felt the weight of her sin and my sin and yours and anybody else who's listening. I mean, he he bore our sin. The Bible says he bore our sin on the cross. Uh, he you know so that we could die to sin and live to righteousness. He took our sins upon himself. He could only do that if he was truly in flesh and incarnate and human. Mm -hmm. And he was. And so these big tears form in this little junior high girl's eyes yeah. and explained okay. to her <laughs> that he felt he felt all of that. But she had to under I believe I believe that wasn't cruel. I believe that that was what she needed to understand. I said, I said to Tricia, he loves you so much. He felt all judgment for your sin, all the pain you would have felt. And he did that for you. Yeah. You have to understand. It. He didn't make himself not feel. And that's, and that would be, that would be dipping into a, a early, early church heresy called docetism, which was yeah. Jesus seemed to be human, but he really wasn't. So he wasn't in flesh. And so he probably didn't feel things. No, he was fully in flesh, fully man, uh, fully God, fully man. Yeah. Well, as you mentioned before, you know, with heresy kind of being defined as when you stretch mm -hmm. things too much to where other truths start kind of falling through the floor. Mm -hmm. um, God being human, if if we mess with that too much, you know, people may not realize the implications, the philosophical implications that has on a ton of other places. On um, if 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 Jesus wasn't really a human, does he really know what we're going through? And and that kind of gives us a little bit of permission to judge, like, well, God made us terribly. Yeah. We're terribly made, yeah. <laughs> fearfully and terribly made, yeah. you know. Uh, but but because he was fully man, because he experienced what we experience, it, it adds to that conversation. Yeah. It kind of creates it like, okay, wait, there's more to this. Yeah. Uh, and, and, yeah, and, and that's not just in that uh, area, but yeah. in all areas of theology, yeah. we have to think about the implications of maybe it makes us feel better, what implications does this have on other things? Yeah. Well, I think, I think of, um, you know, the, the Bible talks about that Jesus was tempted in every way as we are. Yeah. And yet without sin. Yeah. So that's the qualifier, yet without sin. But tempted in every way as we are. And we tend to think of temptation as sin, sin itself. Right. But tempt being tempted is not sin. Acting on temptation is sin. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, three different temptations. Uh, and, but he didn't, he didn't succumb or give in to them. And so, yeah, it, it, if we if we um, try to change biblical theology to accommodate our brokenness and our mistakes, well, it's God's fault. And I've heard uh, you know, so, so, some of some of the modern philosophers in our culture are comedians, mm -hmm. and I won't quote specific comedians, but I actually I actually enjoy 
uh, watching comedians for uh, because they're highly skilled communicators. They know how to make a point very very quickly. Yeah. So I, I and I and I also like to laugh. And so if, if I can if I can find good 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 comedians, I'll, I'll enjoy. Uh, but but I think that many comedians in our world who are not followers of Jesus. Um, not saying all comedians aren't followers of Jesus, but I'm saying some comedians aren't, uh, and they can still be they can still be humorous so I've heard. and funny. Yeah, I've, I've read about that. Uh, but but they'll they'll but they'll often simplify things and say, well, if uh, if God is so powerful, why did He make someone like me or someone like you? Why would He create such fractured beings? Right. And uh, and almost the sense that I can stand in front of God and say it's your fault that I I'm mixed up, and yeah. and I think that. Again, they're they're not trying to be theologians, but they are doing theology. But but in most cases, it's very simplistic theology, yep. and it's almost it's almost theology as if they were going for a punchline, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, because that's where because that's where they're headed. It's like meme theology, exactly, it's exactly. The same kind of track. Yeah, and so I you know I, I guess I would just say that um, if if we're looking at compromising, you know, I I I've picked, I years ago. I don't I don't know if somebody speaking I heard a speaker say this, or it just was a picture in my mind, so I won't claim credit for it, but the idea that theologically we're holding, it's like you're holding onto two ropes that are pulling in the opposite direction. So when you get to the, the divinity of Christ, you're holding onto that, and the humanity of Christ, you're holding onto that, and it kind of pulls and stretches you, and you try to kind of hold onto both of them. If you let go of either of them, you lose the, you know, the core of what the scriptures teach. Yeah. And uh, because the scriptures teach without question, you hold on to the fact that Jesus was fully divine, God with us, Emmanuel, fully man, he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Um, he can understand and, and sympathize with us. He can intercede for us now because he knows what we're going through. Know. So, and, and so part of the Christian journey is holding on to two things that can feel like they're in contrast to each other or even working directly against each other. Yeah. And, yet, and yet you find in those two things together, you're holding to the fullness of the truth. Yeah. And 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 so and it's and it's not always easy and it's certainly not easy to articulate, but I think that uh, when you talk about the incarnation, the divinity of Jesus and the humanity of Jesus, that's one of the the absolute. There's there's a handful of like core theological concepts that make Christians Christians. Right. And so if if you read if you read the first verse of the New World Translation of the Gospel of John, the New World Translation is the translations uh, done by the Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay. You'll say, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Mm, just a little, <laughs> okay, um, small little addition there. And, and it's, it's, yeah, and you go, okay, that changes everything, right? Right. And, uh, and so you have to say, okay, we can't dabble with those things. And, and this is why when people look and say, um, well, the Bible's an ancient book, so, you know, we don't have to really, <clears throat> you know, hold to it or believe what it says. Uh, if, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christian, we have, you know, we have, we have this one book. It's a compilation of sixty-six different yeah. pieces, you know, poetic books, uh, his, you know, historical narrative, all all true. But some are some are poetic, some are historical narratives, some are um, you know po- poetry, yeah. um, and yet all inspired by God. We have, we have this one book that guides us as Christians. If we don't hold to that. Uh, what I've said over and over again through the years is I'd, I'd be gone fishing, gone golfing, gone doing something else mm-hmm. if I didn't believe it was true. Yep. Uh, is it always easy to understand and, and to explain simplistically? No. Um, you know, I've been a pastor now for pressing towards four decades, and I feel like, you know, like you mentioned earlier, you can read the Gospels, read part of the Bible for, for the for the first time, the 50th time, because it's a fresh new insight that comes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I just, you know, I... When it comes to theology, there's continual learning, continual growth. But I believe the Bible doesn't change, and uh, and so I hold to it. I preach it. I teach it. And I think of I think of Billy Graham had a point right before his L.A. crusade, his first really big crusade. He was up at a camp called Forest Home uh, Camp and Conference Grounds in the San Bernardino Mountains, and he was grappling with the Bible. And he was just saying, you know, people are questioning the Bible. He was hearing the same stuff that's going on now. Mm-hmm. It wasn't on the internet with you know. Every you know every high school kid who wants to create their own site being able to get commentary on it, but it was the same kinds of discussion going on, and he was struggling with things. And he he actually set his Bible on a on kind of a tree stump out in the woods area by himself, got on his knees praying, and just said, "Lord, there's so much of this I understand. There's so much I can <coughs> excuse me, so much I can embrace and explain, but there's parts of this that are beyond my understanding. Mm-hmm. So for all that I can understand, I, I you know I believe it by faith, but for the parts I can't understand." 
I accept my fate. Mm -hmm. And he got up and started his public ministry. And that, that crusade in LA was like the launch into his public ministry, massive, um, huge, wonderful impact on people's lives. Yeah. And, uh, and so there is a, there's a part for, even for me as a pastor, where I look and say, there's, I've, I've studied apologetics. I've studied, I mean, I've studied lots of stuff. So my intellect can get me so far, but I kind of look at it like, um, if like, this is, if this is my intellectual capacity and this is the, the part of faith, here's sort of the veil of history and my ability. And I can see how my, what I understand and what I put faith in are coming close, but often I don't see where they totally intersect and come together. Right. That's kind of behind the veil of my capacity. Yeah. And, but there'll come a day when that veil will be lifted away. I'll go, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> how can I not, you know, and, um, and, and that, that part I have to, that there's, I don't quickly go to, I just believe it by faith, yeah. but I will say this. There's always a part of faith that is faith. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's powerful. And, and I think, I know in my journey, there was a stage where that felt like a cop out, but mm -hmm. then, and, and I think a lot of people will stop there, but, it, it, but you keep, if you keep going and you keep yeah. trying to gain understanding, you realize that, well, two things. One, every worldview has that. Yes. Every worldview, there is no proving without a doubt, oh, this is clearly how this is. Even yeah. science itself proudly and, and part of its nature is that, like, well, if we can't explain something, yeah. we have faith that, well, one day we will be able to we'll with science, yeah. right? Yeah. right? We'll keep working. We'll put our lab coats on and yeah. get to work, right? That, that's, that, that used to be the tone that used of to be science. Yeah, it's, much, it's, it's become much more dogmatic, as has many things in our, in our world. Yeah, yeah. We're, yeah. we're in a weird time right yeah. now. Yeah. But uh, it's also, there's also something to be said about the struggle itself being valuable. And yeah. I, this probably isn't a core, a pillar of Christianity, but this is one of the things I'm super passionate about in, in, in making sure the struggle isn't wasted. And, and the struggle yeah. in trying to um, understand this stuff I would say, I don't know if you'd agree, I guess this is sort of off topic, yeah. but it, an it, interesting point. Um, I would say that that struggle is intentional, yeah. that, that God did not make us with all the answers on purpose, that yeah. somehow we are more valuable yeah. in the pursuit of knowledge than just having knowledge yeah. uh, given to us. And, and being comfortable that in the journey of that pursuit, that, that journey of that pursuit is, is, part of, is part of the joy of it all and the glory of it all. And that in some cases, in that pursuit, will never fully arrive. Right. And and uh, and probably in most pursuits, we'll never fully arrive. But certainly, in when it comes to, to hopefully, we arrive in terms of knowing who Jesus is. We enter a relationship with Him. We we walk with Him hand in hand. That there's things that I've arrived at that point. So I think of it like that. That picture of my capacity and and then the part of faith and where they finally intersect. There's areas that I was kind of back here, mm -hmm. you know. And as the years have gone by, I've got a, okay. I can see how. My what I understand and what I believe by faith are coming closer and closer together, but there's always that veil at some point yeah. where it doesn't come perfectly together. Right. And it's it's fun when I go from here to here and I go, I have this new say, oh but I oh yeah, yeah. I get it. But I go oh, now I have it perfectly figured out. Mm -hmm. At least on the on the massive pillar kind of things we're talking about here. Yeah. There's such a there there is an aspect of it that is continuing the pursuit and the trusting in God. I think of it like one of the, and I don't know if you're going to do a podcast on, and I wouldn't call it, might, you might, but I don't know if it would be a pillar thing, but eschatology, the, mm -hmm. the doctrine of end times and how everything kind of wraps up. And there are people who want to take what the Bible says about the end of all things. Right. And they want to figure it all out, have charts and graphs and characters and figures, and this is this, this is, and have it all figured out. And there's people who have written books where they go, it's basically like, I got it figured yeah. out. And you can know too for just fourteen ninety five, exactly. and so you know buy my book and 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 that I look and go if God had wanted us to understand exactly how all things wrap up, He would not have He would not have put it in apocalyptic cryptic language. He would have just said, "Here's what's going to happen right in twenty twenty four, yeah, um, year of our Lord. This will happen. And this will. and so what happens is people keep trying to push so far that they want to understand it that they make really fanciful. Uh, kind of speculations and declare that it's true yeah. and they know when Jesus is going to return or what's going to happen and they and then people who are following them end up kind of falling apart or losing their faith because they were putting their faith in this kind of odd speculative um, system developed by a person mm -hmm. and not being able to say that that when it comes to how all things wrap up the Bible gives a couple key things like God's going to win 
keep following Jesus, even think when things get tough along the way. There's some like epic things, but there's not a clear picture of exactly how it all goes and we, that we can understand. Right. And so there's something, and I think it's, it's left that way so that we will long for understanding yeah. someday Pursue and not it. try to figure it all out. Yeah. And so, and I'm not trying to belittle the people that, that work hard at that, but I would be concerned about the people who say, I've got it all figured out. Right, right. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a continual journey that, uh, at least for myself, I've learned to love it. You know, yeah. I've learned yeah. that that's kind of a part of it. And that pursuit teaches me so much more, even outside of what I'm looking for. Yeah. It, it teaches me how to think and, and this powerful stuff. Well, we've got a little off topic. Last, last thing here while we wrap up. Next week, we're going to be talking about specifically uh, the death and resurrection, the theology yeah. behind that. Um, go a little more into like kind of the atonement stuff. And we touched on that here. But while we're talking about Jesus, while he was still uh, physically alive on, uh, on, uh, in his uh, fully human, fully God body, what was his ministry? What was his objective while he was here? Why did he come? Yeah. Well, Jesus, I think Jesus gives his um, kind of his mission statement. One of Jesus' self-designation, interestingly, is son of man. Mm-hmm. So he would refer to himself, the son of man, the son of man. Uh, actually, it's, there, there's, there's a son of man character in the book of Ezekiel and also in the book of Daniel. And so it's interesting. Um, so the Jewish mind would have had some framework for what he was talking about. But when he would say the son of man, he was talking about me, Jesus. Yeah. And so one of the things that Jesus said is the son of, son of man came uh, not to serve, but to uh, not, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mm-hmm. He also said at one point, I have come to seek and save that which is lost. So I put those two things together. To kind of Jesus' mission statement was, I didn't come for everybody to serve me. If so, I'd have been born not in a manger, but in a palace. I'd have been born as not, not as a uh, humble servant, but as a exalted Roman Roman emperor type, right? right. So he said, I, I didn't come to, ser- to, to be served, but to serve. I came to give my life as a ransom. So he said, I came to lay my life down. And, uh, and then he said, I came to seek and save that which is lost. And his, the laying down of his life was part of that process of making a way for lost, broken human beings to come back home mm-hmm. to God. And so I think ultimately Jesus' mission was, uh, and I think from, from, the, from the, the womb of Mary to the cross to the resurrection and even interceding for us today, that, I think that mission stays the same, and that is that, that those who are lost and wandering like sheep without a shepherd uh, could be brought home by Jesus, the good shepherd. That was his heart. That was his desire. Yeah. And um, one of the things that, that the Bible says is that God desires that none would perish, but all would come to eternal life. And then again, again, your weekend philosophers would say, well, if that's what God wants, then why doesn't it happen? Because he's all-powerful. Right. Another podcast on the sovereignty, yeah. knowledge of God, for yes. knowledge, freedom, all that. But, but I believe that Jesus not only would say, but really said when he walked on this earth, I have come to lay my life down, to seek and save those who are lost, not to be served, but to sacrifice myself and to enter a relationship with any human being who wants to receive that gift of grace, take my hand and walk with me. And I, and I believe there's no, uh, with all the theology we talk about, at the end of the day, that's the heart of God. That was the heart of Jesus and continues to be the heart of Jesus. And that's why he continues to say to us, shine your light, be salt in a world that should be thirsting for the living water of Jesus. And that's that's a lot of what Shoreline Church is about. Right. What, certainly what my calling in life is about is to try to emulate that, that heart for people that are wandering far from Jesus, as well as those who know Jesus to grow in faith. Yep. So, well, next week we'll talk about kind of the end of that, how, how we finally get to uh, fully come into a relationship with God through the uh, death and resurrection of Jesus and how that all works together. But uh, That would be a pillar. That would be a pillar, yeah. yes, yes, a, a very much a pillar. Probably the pillar, I would say, of the Christian faith. So uh, right in time, a little bit before Easter, so people can tune in uh, to that. But thank you so much, as usual, Kevin. We'll, uh, we'll see you next time. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to the podcast. If you want to hear more, make sure to subscribe, whether you're watching on our YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app. We do these nearly every week. I'm going to say nearly. We're going to try to put these out every week, but with scheduling and with the world kind of coming back online slowly after COVID, uh, uh, things are getting a little busier for people. So we're going to do our best, but with scheduling, sometimes there may be a week off or so that we have uh don't freak out the podcast isn't in danger we're still we're still here but uh we will get these out uh as as close to weekly as possible and our next episode is going to be on the death and resurrection of jesus so you're not going to want to miss it right in time for the easter season 
So we will see you next time. And if you are a Shoreline Congregation member, I know a lot of our uh, uh, listeners are from elsewhere, but if you are one of the people here at Shoreline, make sure you join us for our Easter and Good Friday services. You can find all the information on our website at shoreline.church. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you there outdoors. You have to register, so make sure you go online and do that, or as usual on our live stream. So we will see you next time with the death and resurrection of Jesus. Thanks for tuning in.